Hello, everyone. Uh, I want to thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to present some of my computer vision image analysis research uh, uh, here in, in front of all the members of, of IDPAC. I'm very, very excited uh, by these results, and I think they really have the potential to change how we look at photo archives and how we collaborate between photo archives. Um, I, this is just going to completely change how uh, a collaboration occurs and when we can find uh, uh, duplicate records across archives. I'm very excited. So I wanted to take you through some of uh, uh, the results and uh, hopefully just uh, uh, finish up with some time for, for questions. Um, I want to start by looking at the initial analysis that uh, I've been doing with the Frick Photo Archive very briefly before getting into uh, uh, the additional results we have. I think one of the big things that's so exciting about uh, uh, using computer vision technology is that it really opens the door for uh, a very strong collaboration between photo archives. Now this is something that has already been occurring and there have been many projects around this, but I have the feeling that computer vision research is going to make this just so much simpler in a way that wasn't previously possible. Now the thing that is is really, really effective here is that, and especially with the, with the algorithms that I'm using, is that computer vision research has the potential to find highly similar images. So these are these are cases where you have a, a, a photo of an artwork, for example, and you're able to find artworks that look either identical or nearly identical. Uh, now this can be extremely useful, and I'll show you some examples of this. Now this technique works well for a number of different uh, types of images, namely uh, photos, prints, uh, anything where there's going to be uh, uh, lots of copies, and two-dimensional uh, generally works best. So I wrote some software uh, just over a year ago now using this commercial service called Match Engine, and it is very, very good at doing this image matching, where it's able to find images that are very, very similar to one another. And the nice thing about them is that it's even able to work with portions of an image or even work with black and white images. It doesn't have to have, they don't have to be in color. Um, so this service is provided by a, a, com a Canadian company called Tinai, and uh, they've been uh, very, very interested in supporting this research. Um, they, they are very excited about finding new opportunities for people to be able to use computer vision technology uh, outside of the current use cases. For the most part, right now, people are just using computer vision work, um, uh, especially like uh, in the case of what they're doing, for just like, you know, detecting brand usage or copyright infringement or stuff like that. Uh, whereas I think the potential goes way, way beyond that. So effectively what I'm doing is I'm taking a large number of images. Uh, so these are images that come from this, you know, like for example, the Frick uh, Photo Archive, and I upload thousands or tens of thousands of them up to Match Engine. And, and then I can go through to Match Engine and I can say, all right, for a given image, uh, in this case, image one, uh, show me what images are similar uh, to it. In this case, it'll imagine it'll come back and say, oh, I image one is similar to image two and image nine, and, and image two is similar to image one, and you can sort of get these relationships. So you, where you can say, okay, these two images are very, very similar to each other. There is this uh, uh, relationship now between them, and that can be very, very useful. If we look at a traditional photo archive, uh, it's usually broken down in a manner like this. There's the general archive, and then within it, there are artworks. And the artworks themselves are made up of a uh, by a number of images or, or, or photos. Um, and what we're really interested in is in finding matches, uh, uh, not just between the images, but between an artwork and an artwork. 
uh, uh, so so for example, if um, the Frick has one artwork with three images and the, the Zuri Foundation has an artwork with five images and there's some some of those images are similar to each other, we want to know that. So then that way we can say, okay, these two artworks are the same, even if not all the images are the same. Just to show you some examples of what this technology is capable of. These are some results uh, from the initial analysis that was done on the uh, of Frick's anonymous Italian archive. And so it's able to find cases here where we have images that are very, very similar to each other. There's just slight differences in the, in the quality of the photograph. Um, same here, some of the slightly different cropping and even cases where there's pretty dramatic differences in lighting. Uh, I think this is especially interesting because, uh, you know, sometimes th this is happening because of uh, the original photograph, the quality of the photograph wasn't very good or the scan of the photograph wasn't good or, or, or something, uh, but is able to work around those uh, issues for the most part. It's also able to work around cases uh, where you have essentially alternate images but or a portion of an image. So you can see in this case here, we have one uh, a portion of a larger piece. So these two images match each other and even though it's just a small portion of the larger one that's matching. You can see it here too, where you have one image that is simply representing a small portion of a much larger, longer piece. And these two are still matching each other. Now this is very, very useful. It helps to give you that additional context you would need uh, when you're doing this research. And it's even able to work when you have color photographs and black and white photographs of, of the same work. Even though one of the pieces doesn't have color, it is still able to work around that. Now, additionally, it's able to find a number of cases that I think are really interesting. So you're able to find cases like this one where it's a piece uh, presumably uh, uh, before and after conservation. Now, uh, to, to my untrained eye. It looks as if this one is before conservation. You can see there's damage and there's these additional crowns and there's more damage up here. But then afterwards, uh, those p th that damage is not there. Uh, so, but, th but that's very interesting because the, at least in the image analysis, the algorithm did not care about that. It, all it's looking for are images that are very, very similar to one another and that definitely qualifies. Additional cases like this where, again, you, you see very, uh, uh, I, it's, it's hard for me to tell if this is just differences in lighting or it's actually differences in, in possibly conservation or something. Um, but this is, this is definitely a case here where uh, uh, you can see this particular image is showing the work in a very broken state. Uh, it's possible that this uh, is either before and after conservation or this could have been uh, damaged at some point. So this may be before and this may be after. Uh, but these are the questions that uh, uh, researchers can and should uh, look at. Uh, the, the, uh, the tool, the algorithm itself, won't be able to answer these questions per se. It'll just make these discoveries and leave it up to the researcher to uh, figure out what's actually going on. Also able to find cases like this. So like, here is a, a case where you have copies of an artwork. Um, if you look closely, you can see that the faces uh, of this uh, on, on this person and the globes are actually different, even though they look very similar. And as it turns out, they're both uh, copies of a, a Leonardo da Vinci work. Another case here, uh, where you have sort of these uh, 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 frolicking children, and it, it, again, they look very, very similar to each other, but there are obvious differences. You know, there 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 are children missing down here. Uh, the chandelier is different. The curtains are different. They're obviously very inspired by one another. And again, that, that's an interesting thing to look into. And another one here, which is similar to the other, previous one, where the faces are seemingly very similar, but you can see there's differences in the necklace here. Uh, so again, that's it's interesting to look into. Now, another thing that can come from this is since you're doing this, uh, you're only looking at the images when doing this this image analysis. You're not looking at any of the metadata. Now, this is important 
because if there is disagreement in the metadata, you know, for example, disagreement on, on who the artist is or, or what century it was created or what the subject matter is, it doesn't care about that. And you can look at this case here. This is a case where this is obviously the same artwork, um, but the actual metadata disagrees. One, it, one says that it's arms with folded hands, other one that says it's a uh, female head. It's obviously a female head, and th this is the wrong uh, uh, cataloging. And it just so happened that this was a mistake that was made during the cataloging process itself. But this is something now that this can be flagged and say like, okay, this is, this is not right. Um, but a researcher can go in and be like, oh, oh, I see what happened here. There is just wrong cataloging details put in and they can fix that. And there's another case here, which I find to be pretty amusing. Uh, you have two images, a still life, a bottle, a plate, a mortar and pestle, which is correct. And then down here is a virgin enthroned nursing Christ between two saints, uh, which is definitely not correct. Um, so again, this is another case where. The, the, the cataloging and the metadata disagrees between these two images, but the images themselves are still similar and they still f come up with that match. Now, this can be very, very useful. So the project status is that up until now, we've been validating this technology, uh, uh, simply looking at how the technology is working on these particular uh, uh, data sets of Italian art in this case, and especially the Frick's anonymous Italian art collection. And so far we found that it works very, very well. So one of the big questions we now want to answer and what I'm going to be talking about today is now that if it, since it works for a single collection, how well does it work for multiple collections from multiple institutions? So what I've done is I've taken the data from the Frick anonymous Italian art collection and I've combined it together with the 15th and 16th century Italian art of photo collections from the Zuri Foundation. And this is, this is I, I feel, uh, very, very exciting. I just wanted to show, uh, so, so one part that, that's coming up from this is that we've received a grant from the Crest Foundation, a digital resources grant. And this is, we're using this to do this research and to support creation of some open source tools so that we can uh, make this technology available to more people um, and especially other members of, of EdPAC. So uh, everything that you see here uh, today should be and will be reproducible. So these are some, I just want to show some results that came up during the analysis of, uh, uh, of the photos from the Zuri uh, Foundation. Uh, so these are cases here where you have uh, one work which was part of a, a, a small portion of another image. And you can see it here too. I think this was really interesting. So this is a, a, a detail here. Um, and you can see it's actually down over here, just this tiny little portion here, but it's still matched. I think that's really, really interesting. Uh, I'm really surprising that it was able to find that. Uh, cases like this as well. So this is a case where it's seemingly all part of the same larger piece. Um, and there are obviously a lot of visual similarity between the two, but the actual contents are, are different. And this, uh, uh, this piece as well, where again, there's, there's lots of visual similarities uh, but the actual contents are different. And again, that's probably because they're uh, part of the same piece. And in fact, you can see there's a portion of this one uh, in the other one as well. And, and you, again, you come into the case where there are uh, works that are very, very similar to each other or are copies of one another. Um, and so this is, you know, yeah, uh, where you have uh, uh, Mary with with Jesus and and again it's it's they're they're highly similar you know they, they have the same little ledge or standing the similar way they have the same fruit but they're obviously unique works of art uh now this case i think is really interesting because this is definitely uh an instance where a researcher could definitely dig in and find out more information about uh, uh what's going on here is one inspired by another is one a copy of another um it, i'm sure there, there's lots of really interesting questions that can be answered and then cases like this where you have four works that are all 
highly, highly similar to one another, uh, but with variations. Um, there's a woman here in this one, uh, a man in the rest. Uh, but, but for the most part, they're very, very similar. And again, the visual analysis was able to find them, uh, uh, find matches between them. Now, I should note that at least in this case, in, uh, that a researcher had already gone through and cataloged all of these together manually. Uh, so these had already been grouped together, but the image analysis confirmed that they were, in fact, uh, um, similar works of art. So the big question that I'm excited about answering is what happens when we combine archives? Now, what's interesting about this is that we can start to answer questions that weren't previously possible. We can, we can start to find relationships between an artwork in one archive and an artwork in another archive, which I think is really, really interesting and very useful, uh, especially so to researchers. But additionally, we can start to discover new relationships within, our, within a single archive. So this is a case where, for example, the Frick's photo archive can start to become even better because it merges with the Zuri and other institutions. By having that additional data in there, you're able to uh, uh, fill in missing relationships that weren't known about before. So to start, um, uh, as, I, as I mentioned previously, we wanted to start with some collections to, to uh, start with this analysis. And what we did was is that we started with uh, the Frick Anonymous Italian Art Collection, and this spans uh, many centuries and you know, isn't limited to just a particular uh, uh, time period. Uh, and then we also worked with the Ziri Foundation's Italian Art uh, Archives. And in this case, we, we were just looking at the Ziri's 15th and 16th century collections. So the big thing that we wanted to be able to do was we wanted to be able to find cases where there were similarities between images in the two different archives, and then by extension, similarities between two artworks. So after some initial analysis, we found that, uh, so I'm gonna go through the 15th century results and the 16th century results. So here in the 15th century, the Frick has 2,256 artworks represented in their collection, and the Zuri has 17,929 artworks represented. Now, there was, a, there was a good amount of overlap between these two collections. In the Frick's collection, 578 artworks, that's 26% of all their artworks, were also represented in the Zuri collection. And in the Ziri, since there, there were many more artworks being represented, uh, uh, there were 655 artworks that also matched something in the Frick, but that only represented 4% of their collection. Now, this is, this is really interesting, uh, having this high degree of overlap, and especially since this is something that happens automatically. The computer vision algorithm was able to go through and find all these relationships between all these artworks uh, simply by looking at the images. And if we look at the 16th century, now in, in the Frick, there are more artworks this time, 3,685. The Ziri has 19,000 uh, uh, artworks. And, but we can see that there's actually, there are less artworks overlapping. There's only about 8% from, uh, that are from the Frick that match in the Ziri, and only 2% from the Ziri that match into the Frick. Probably just differences uh, in, the, in the style and contents of the collections. So one of the big things we wanted to do is we wanted to verify the matches that were happening here. And we wanted to make sure that the relationships that we were seeing between the Frick's collection and the Ziri's collection uh, uh, were confirmed by something that some, some, by matches that a researcher had done manually. So in this case, what we did was uh, uh, a researcher uh, at uh, Ziri, Francesca, went through and found 77 artworks that were in the Ziri collection, 15th century artwork collection, and in the Frick's anonymous Italian collection. Now, what we did is we went through and determined whether those matches were confirmed by the image analysis. 
And as we can see, 84% of those matches that were done manually were confirmed. And that's that's certainly very good. Um, look at, just want to show a couple examples here of cases that failed, uh, that did not, uh, that were not successfully validated. Uh, so we can see here this, this case uh, uh, failed, and there's some pretty dramatic differences in lighting. Uh, this one, the lighting isn't nearly as good, and a lot of the detail is lost. Uh, so the, the the match did not occur, and this one uh, did not occur. Where it's this is actually a tiny detail of of the of the larger piece. This is actually just representing this tiny little area here. Uh, this the algorithm, while it's able to find portions of a larger image, generally speaking, the portion has to be. Uh, uh, no smaller than 30% of the other image. Uh, so in this case, this is a very small portion uh, on probably less than 5 10%. So these results are really, really exciting. The fact that the computer is able to automatically confirm 84% of the matches that were manually completed by a researcher is just really, really promising. It means that we're going to be able to uh, automatically merge and find matches between large portions of these catalogs without any human intervention. Now, uh, Francesca went through uh, additional images uh, uh, from the Zeri archive um, that we haven't analyzed yet autom automatically, and she's found that there's actually 60% overlap um, for, uh, for, for the uh, portions that she looked at between the Frick and the Zeri. So there's actually a lot of potential here uh, for the computer to be able to go through and analyze these images and find all of these matches. Um, there's still lots and lots of potential, and I think it shows you know, a, a lot of promise. So I think one of the big questions is probably on everyone's minds now is how do we add a new collection? So I've done this now with the Frick, and I've done this with the Zeri's 15th and 16th century collections. And I wanted to show very, very practically how exactly this was done. And and if we were going to add a new collection into this, how it would happen. Now, specifically, the data that I used to do this uh, was a very specific set. Where, uh, and I only needed a very small amount, which was I needed some sort of ID for an artwork, um, it's some sort of ID for an image, and a link between every image and an artwork. So, uh, uh, just, to, just to show some examples of some data formats. So here are some examples from the Frick and from the Zuri. So this is this is from the Frick where they sent me uh, an Excel file containing image metadata, and. It, there's actually much, much longer than this, uh, but this is just a portion. And you can see going through, and I, I exported it as a, a tab separated value file, a TSV file. And you can see here, here's the name of the image, uh, a title, uh, what the medium is, and, and, and all sorts of additional details, including the century in which it was created. Now, what I did was I wrote a, a custom program to go through and convert it into this format, where we have the source from which this data is coming, the ID of the artwork, and the ID of the image, the century in which it was created. And you can see here, it just kind of continues through. So here, uh, uh, for Frick, so you can see there's the Frick, artwork ID 6835, uh, image ID 6835, century 14. Um, very, very straightforward, uh, um, amount of data. Same thing for the Zeri, only their data was formatted differently. Uh, in, their case, in this case, they sent me uh, some XML files, and this had um, all the details that I needed. So here was the ID of the image, and this is the ID of the artwork. So I went through the XML file and correlated all this together to create a result like this. So you can see here, here's the source, it's the Zuri. Artwork is 51798, the image ID is 99784, and the century in which it was created. And you can just go through image by image by image and have those relationships. Now the format for the images was very, very simple. 
it's really just a zip file with all the images in it and the, in the uh, and the names of the of the files should correlate to the ids that you that are specified here so in this case uh in, in the case of the zeri's data there was a file named 99785.jpg and there was another file named 99788.jpg um and that was all put into a zip file and they sent it to me using a uh, we transfer it ended up being um a few gigabytes worth of data, but using WeTransfer, this happens uh, uh, pretty quickly. It, it definitely happens over the course of, um, I would say, less than an hour. Um, probably uh, less than an hour to download. It may take longer to upload on their end. Now, the images themselves, uh, they don't need to be very large. They should be at least 300 pixels in the smallest dimension. Um, larger images are certainly good and preferred, uh, but they don't have to be uh, uh, that big. Um, currently in, in this system, I, I have about 88,000 images from both the Frick and the Zuri. Uh, so it, the quantity shouldn't matter that much, at least on, on the, the current scale that, that we're operating on of, of tens and hundreds of thousands of images. So I, I think when it comes down to it, it's it's pretty easy to add a new collection. Now, the reason why it's easy is because I've been writing all these tools to make it easy. And that's been part of this grant that I've received from the Crest Foundation is that given th uh, this data and given a collection of images, you, there are a certain number of, of scripts that can be run by uh, a, a developer and all the images will be added into the system and it'll all be available for research. Uh, generally speaking, is that once all these tools are in place, it takes me, given all the data, and, and, and if all the data is formatted nicely, I'd say about a day uh, to add it in. Now, one of the things I wanted to show is some additional analysis that I've been doing. And this is a, a technique called uh, graph analysis. Now, this is really interesting. So graph analysis is looking at the... Uh, connections between things, uh, the, the links between them. So to show an example, here are uh, uh, three artworks. These two are at the Frick, and this one's at the Zuri. And these artworks are each represented by a single image. Now, the image analysis algorithm went through and said, okay, this artwork at the Frick is the same as this artwork at the Zuri. And additionally, this artwork at the Frick is the same as this artwork at the Zuri. Now, what's interesting about this is so you, so you have these three artworks that are all related to each other. But you would think that if 420 here was related to the Zuri image and 417 was related to the Zuri image, why isn't there a relationship between 417 and 420 at the Frick? Now, if we look at the actual images, we can see why that's the case. It's because they're both portions of a much larger piece. This is representing this portion, uh, of this left-hand side of this piece. This is representing the right-hand side. And they were categorized into different artworks. Now, this is interesting uh, because since these two archives were merged and brought into this single collection, we were able to discover this new relationship that we didn't know about before. And this new relationship only came about because the archives were merged. Now, if we had only done analysis on just the Frick, uh, then we would not have found this relationship. And if we had only done analysis in Missouri, we wouldn't have found it. But because we did analysis on both of them together, we we're able to discover this. And I think that's really, really exciting because it's showing the potential of what happens when we bring these archives together. This is another case here. So this is a case where, again, we have two artworks at the Frick, one artwork at the Zuri. But in this case, the Zuri had two images categorized together uh, as a single artwork whereas both of these ones of the Frick were, were categorized separately. And if we look at it, we can see why uh, it, it, most, it seems to mostly have to do with lighting. 
Um, these ones were lit much more darkly, and, and these are, are much, much brighter. So those relationships came up. Now, this one is really, really interesting. And this is the last one I want to show. So here we have uh, uh, two artworks at the Zuri and two artworks at the Frick. And each of them are representing two different images. <laughs> so what you have here is you have the image 8131A is similar to image 57130 uh, uh, at at the at the Zuri and image five seven one three eight is similar to eight one three two a and you have but the thing is is that there is no relationship here there's no relationship between this artwork at the Zuri and this artwork at the Zuri nor is there a relationship between this artwork at the Frick and this artwork at the Frick so again this is a case where by bringing these two collections together we're able to discover all these relationships that we didn't know about before and that computer vision analysis couldn't do alone. Uh, so while the computer vision analysis was able to find relationships, relationships between these two artworks and these two and these two and these two, um, it can't find the relationship between the other two because th there, w there wasn't enough information. So, so just to show you the, the artworks themselves, um, the reason for why, why this occurred is that the artworks had been organized separate differently in both cases um the 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 i assume the panels of the painting have been separated and split in different ways and just to show you that there's a lot of potential for this there are lots and lots of cases of this just to show you some very very complex cases that i found so the, here we have cases where we have one two three four five different artworks at the at, at the zuri collection all of them are connected to this one artwork in the frick uh, but none of them are connected to each other. Uh, I think that's really interesting. And there's this other one here that looks a little bit like a spider web. Uh, and we have uh, uh, this this web of five different artworks, and there are all these different connections going through them. And But these are all cases where once we get down to it, this, in fact, is in fact just a single artwork and this is a single artwork and now we can start to really merge all these representations of artworks in these photo archives into a single representation uh, uh into a single cluster and i think that's just that's very very exciting that's something that hasn't really been possible before so i wanted to talk a little bit more about metadata and uh, 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 links data and, and, and what th these techniques can do to benefit them. Um, so computer vision analysis and especially finding these relationships between images has the potential to, I, I feel, uh, build data automatically. So, so discover these relationships that should exist but don't and be able to fill in gaps or even potentially be used to correct uh, mistakes or find new discoveries. Um, so, so one of the one of the difficulties is that if you're trying to merge two photo archives together or many photo archives together, and you're only using metadata, uh, it what you so so for example, you're going through and you're saying, okay, uh, uh, the artist is named Leonardo da Vinci. It was created in this specific year. Uh, the title is a specific name. All these points agree, so we can assume that these are the same artworks. Um, the problem becomes that, well, I guess one, you, you, you have to have the format of the data has to agree. And additionally, the actual contents, the metadata itself has to agree. Uh, and this can be very, very difficult. Um, and this is a case where uh, image analysis ignores that. And always, by only looking at the image itself, you don't have to worry about having all the data agree with each other. And you can work on improving the data after the fact. Now, what's interesting is, is one, of the, one of the points I looked at here was I went through the Frick collection, the Zuri uh, collection, and I looked for cases where there were artworks, where, where there was multiple artworks that matched each other. Um, but the dating on them disagreed. And in the case of the Frick, there were 258 artworks where the dates on them disagreed. In the Zuri, there are 160 artworks 
where the dates disagree. So these are cases, again, where, where you had two artworks that appear to be visually the same, but the metadata itself disagreed. Now, the dating, by these, these, these artworks are placed in different centuries. Um, that would be extremely problematic. Uh, that, it, by placing these artworks in different centuries, it's very likely that using metadata alone, you would never, f or never or, or probably rarely find these artworks as being matching to each other. Whereas the image analysis didn't care about that uh, and was able to find these after the fact. Now, it's also interesting to note that looking at the Frick compared with the Ziri and the Ziri compared with the Frick, we're able to find even more images and more artworks where the dates on them disagreed. So in this case, the, there were actually 391 artworks in the Frick uh, where the, the, the century that was attributed to the artwork was different from a, a matching artwork in the Ziri. In the Zuri, there's 415 artworks where the dating differed from the from this uh, uh, Frick. So, so this is, I think, very very interesting, and it has the potential to really really improve the quality of the metadata that we have, and and especially the, the quality of this the records in general. So, of course, the the, the differences in, in the metadata can be troubling, but I'm very very excited about this technique because it has the potential to easily discover these differences and present them to a researcher who where where we can now say hey there are you know uh, tell this sorry you know there are 160 artworks here where even within your own collection where the dating disagrees and maybe that's something that a researcher can now go through and be like oh uh, there's a mistake in, 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 in how this was written and oh we have better information on this now and be able to correct this so in a lot of ways, this again, this this isn't removing the job of the researcher. It's just removing the hard, tedious, manual hunting, and, and it's just it's making the researcher much more efficient. So I want to talk a little bit about the future. Now, one of the things that I think is very exciting is that obviously we've been able to start doing this initial analysis and find these matches, but this would really be the most useful for. Uh, uh, having some sort of interface for scholars to use. So then that way uh, a scholar could um, search by image or find artworks that are the same across multiple institutions. So then this way someone from, for example, someone from the Frick could uh, look up one of their artworks and find all the other institutions in which that artwork is also represented. And for the inspiration, I, I I, I'm, I'm largely inspired by a project that I've been working on now for a few years, which is a database of, uh, in this case, Japanese woodblock prints. So these are all prints from the you know 16 to 1800s or so. And I've aggregated these from many institutions around the world. And they're now about a quarter million uh, prints contained within it. And it's able to do very similar things to what I showed before, where you're able to find... Uh, many artworks across many institutions. So in this case, we have uh, uh, the same artwork or different impressions of the same artwork from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, Minnesota, British Museum, uh, San Francisco, the Met in New York, Harvard, uh, Tokyo National Museum. So in this way, this is true collaboration now between institutions. Um, and so I imagine that uh, an interface for... Uh, uh, accessing data between the different you know, IDPAC members would end up looking a lot like this, where you would have a single representation of an artwork and you could see all the other images and all the other artworks from all the other institutions. And that would be very, very useful. Um, well, one of, the, one of the points I think is important is that in, 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 in my database, and I think what makes sense for what we would eventually do, is that we should always link back to the institution itself for the actual data. So in this case, while we may have uh, uh, small versions of the photos here, we'll link back to the Frick and the Zuri and other institutions. And so then that way you can always get the, uh, the current most recent metadata directly from the source. And I think that's, that, that, that's, that's honestly what makes the most sense. Now, the, the nice side effect of having this is that now 
we can do stuff like this where we can start to search by image. So this is a case here of, of how this works with the, the Japanese prints where you can use, for example, your cell phone, you can take a photo of an artwork or of a print, or you can upload a pre-existing photo, whichever, and it'll return all the images and all the artworks that match that photo. And now this is very, very useful. Uh, I know in the case of, uh, of my site for, for Japanese prints, scholars use this all the time. It is an indispensable part of their research arsenal because now if they can just, ha they, all, all they have to have is a photo of an artwork, they put it in and instantly they find results from all around the globe. And I think that this could be very, very effective here as well. So to conclude, I am very, very excited about the potential to, uh, uh, to merge photo archives together that we no longer have to necessarily worry about the metadata between all these uh, artworks agreeing before collaboration can begin, that we can use computer vision technology to expedite this process and really improve the quality of research uh, that can be done. So then there will be less manual uh, um, <laughs> slogging through the archives and researchers can, can really dig into what they, what they love. So uh, I'll be taking questions after this, but I'll be happy to answer any additional questions you might have. Please do drop me an email. And additionally, I've written a paper on uh, uh, this, this research, uh, especially the initial research, uh, looking at the Frick's anonymous uh, Italian art archive. Um, and so that paper is available up on my website. Um, please let me know if you have any questions about that as well. And then it, this is a link to the uh, Japanese print database. Um, so again, thank you so much for the opportunity to present this. I really appreciate it. And I, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from all of you.